Find that on Waterstones Online, Amazon, or Fit Up and Fighting Back website. Welcome to another Liquid Bullet Productions. With us today is Mr. Kevin Lane. Thanks for coming, Kevin. You're welcome. So, Kevin served a 20 year jail sentence for mis uh, miscarriage of justice. So, Kevin, can you just explain what the miscarriage of justice was about for us? I was sent to prison for contract killing. Um, in 1995, convicted in 96. Blimey, um, can you tell us a little bit about the case? What was actually f for? So the, um, there was a, a gentleman who was executed in Rickmansworth, Hertfordshire. Uh, he, was a, he was known to the police and people in the area. He was a tough cookie. He got murdered uh, and... Uh, Suspects were arrested originally by a corrupt police officer called D.S. Spackman. D.S. Spackman went to prison in the end for uh, unrelated crime, but uh, very serious crimes. So the, the actual police officer went to prison as well? Yeah, Detective Sergeant. It was Detective Inspector by the time he went to prison. But um, he was Roger Vincent and David Smith's police handler, which has been well covered in the news media and panorama and such. Uh, and they fitted me up. Can I just ask, so how was you connected with this case? How did you get pulled into this, this murder? I came back from Spain. I was living in Spain for a while. Uh, I went out there to start a new business up. I lived in there. I came home. I had a car uh, that I was thinking about buying. It was the same as what I had prior to going to Spain. Back in the day, it was a Ford Cosworth yep. Sapphire. You know, if, if today's event, it'd be like a new Audi or something. Yeah. So I had one of those before I went to Spain and I came home, someone offered me another one. I had a look at it. It was stolen from my house that very evening. Um, as a result of that, I needed a car because the car was my office, so to speak. I do a lot of traveling. And I started looking at vehicles and a vehicle was offered to lend to me. A vehicle was lent to me. That vehicle was then subsequently copied and used in a murder, which brought the police to my door. Blimey. So, so was that car that was used for the murder, like, did someone you knew or was just... I, don't, I can't comment on who committed the murder, only what the evidence portrays and yeah. what has come to light since through the media and such, Panorama and Dunk, the, new, the Guardian and so on and so forth. But the car, uh, the, it was number plates were copied. So yeah. it was like a ring up there. A ring up, yeah. up well, they just, they just plated the car up and used yeah. it in a murder. But the car that was used to kill, uh, for the killer's use to make their escape good, was a different colour to mine, had different wheels, it had, it was very similar colour, a different colour interior, which was proven later on in the investigation because the police refused to let my legal team look at the car. And then when they went to view the car, it had been stripped bare and even the interiors of the car had been stripped bare because they were different colours to what the, the, was seen at the, at the murder scene. Yeah, so it didn't match the... Didn't match. But they, they covered all that up, and it's subsequently come out years later, 
that the car I was loaned was a BMW, but it wasn't the car used in the murder. So that's how come I got brought into it to begin with. Yeah. And then I was arrested three months after the murder by Spackman. And prior to that, Roger Vincent and David Smith had been arrested. And they were going around bragging about the murder and all sorts of things. People witnessed people phoning in saying they see him with a gun in a pub. Um, so the evidence, before I go into this, the evidence was damning for them. Where witnesses are saying they're showing the gun off, call himself Ronnie and Reggie, uh, saying they'd killed McGill. You had a gentleman called Bennett who was arrested because he got caught with a car. And he told the police that Roger Vincent and David Smith gave him that car and asked him to dispose of it. Well, his statements were withheld from me for, well, I got the statements in 2007. So 12 years. Blimey, 12 years. 12 years, okay. Tonight. Yeah. Now, if I'd have had them statements, I'd have said, well, what am I doing sitting here? These two fellas here have been named as giving the car to this fella to burn. What am I doing here? Yeah. And a wealth of other evidence. So that's how come I, came, brought, I was brought into the fold. Can, can I just ask you, what was your, like, when you first got arrested, what was going through your mind? Obviously, you're thinking, what's going on, or? I thought, bleeding on you. I'll be all right, I ain't done it. Yeah, I thought, oh, fucking hell, who's put me in here? But I knew, in a murder investigation, they pull a lot, they pull everybody in, they don't leave no stone, unturn, un, stone unturned. I thought, well, listen, it's a bit heavy, you know, they're resting my guns and yeah. so on. I've never been arrested with guns before. I couldn't quite make it out, but it's a serious crime taken to Watford Police Station at a great pace of knots under blue lights and such, and then released. But I knew something weren't right. As in what sort of sense? What's well, that? the chain of evidence later on showed that, but the way they were conducting their interviews, so in my book, Fitted Up and Fighting Back, yep, okay, Fitted Up and Fighting Back, it covers all the details that are in the criminal justice system that have been disclosed to me. Okay, apologise about my teeth, I've just had them done, so it's a bit, I'm getting used to them, so any words that might seem like they're a bit, <laughs> something else they're not. Um, th so I was taken down to Watford Police Station, and just by way of example, uh, I'm in the interview room with my solicitor, they asked to take my fingerprints. My solicitor says, right, we'll stop the interview now, so you can take the, the, the fingerprints. Get them yeah. sent off to get them compared to anything they've got. Yeah. Well, what they did, they sent the solicitor home and said, I'm not taking them now. Then got me back out of my cell and took another set of prints. Yeah, all right. And then it took another set of prints when I came back from an ID parade from Kilburn. And they've never disclosed them. They've then released me. That, that sounds like they've sort of, they used them fingerprints somewhere else to put... On a bag. Right, okay. That they found my print on three and a half months after they, the, the crime had, had happened. And that bag had been tested by... So many fingerprint, uh, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, uh, home counties, Scotland Yard, and no match to me. So they nick me, take my prints as I've just disclosed to you, and then that bag, we found out all these years later, there's a diary, an exhibit diary to that bag. It was removed from the exhibit rooms during my time of arrest when they took my two sets of prints. And there's no, de no signatures to say why it was removed or by whom, just that it had been removed. Oh, so, so it looks like a case of they've done your fingerprints and stuck them in a bag to, to fit you up, basically. Lee, it was the only time that bag yeah. was removed yeah. without any signatures and whilst I'm in the police station. So then when Rough Justice, which is an old miscarriage of justice programme, Louise Shorty, she was the, the, uh, the not the CEO, she was the, the, the assistant producer on that, they requested the bag for examination, and the police said they didn't know where it was. They'd lost it. How can they do that? That's... And now, then years later, forward on from that, there was another investigation, and they found the bag in the place where it said it was all the time, in the exhibits office. So, so the original guys that you were saying about, the ones that called themselves Ronnie and Reggie, were, yep. they, were they known to you? Did you sort of know them? I knew like, Smith, knew I didn't them? know Vincent. Right. Smith used to come in a club I, I worked the door at. I was a young lad, 18. Yeah. I was asked to work the doors at a very young age. People thought I was a manager, yeah. which was great, because you ain't got to resort to violence. Let's bear this in mind. 
We're here to take care of the customers, not beat them up. Yeah. Okay. They're our clients. We need them clients. So I had a very di- a different outlook on being security work. However, Smith used to come in one of the gaffs I worked at. Um, I just knew him solo and things like that. That was it. Yeah. So can you just sort of talk us through now? So once you've obviously been arrested, sort of what was going on for in your mind and stuff at this at this sort of stage. The line of questioning will always give you an indication maybe of uh, what they're looking for or what, what's going on in that investigation, how they're thinking. Uh, and I knew something weren't right because I thought, oh, why have I been arrested for this? This, this is a bit heavy. Can I, can I just ask, so the, the guys, the other guys, the guys that were like Ronnie and Reggie, had they been arrested for a different crime and obviously submitted this? No, they'd been case. arrested for the murder, going around bragging so that they'd done it. Right. Hence by the fellow who got caught with the car saying that he gave them the car, okay. um, showing the gun off and so on and so forth, and a, a wealth of other material. So the deceased sister-in-law turned around and said that Roger Vincent's brother had told them that no money was paid for the murder. So that's coming from someone who's, someone's brother who's been arrested for the murder and they've told the sister-in-law of the fellow, yeah. And obviously, two weeks before the murder, the deceased brother uh, had, or sister-in-law, I think, sister-in-law had had a disagreement with Vincent's mother and slapped her around the face. All this was withheld. It, it seems crazy, sort of, um, in, in that sort of period. There was a lot of crimes, a bit like yourself, like the, uh, the Essex boy murder and um, Ricky Percival, that... The people got arrested for the crimes and then they've turned super grass and fitted someone else up. Happens all the there time. There seems to be a lot of it sort of at that sort of stage going on. Spackman was Vincent and Smith's handler for another case years ago where they had a kidnapping and they attempted murder. Uh, and in an, in an investigation, Spackman says he became very close with them. So much so that when Vincent was acquitted for the murder that I'm now serving time for, by the judge, by the way. He didn't go to a jury. The trial was stopped halfway and the judge just acquitted him. Well, I was told that Vincent was going to get acquitted at halfway submissions after I got convicted by Kenny Collins. Kenny Collins had Ralph Himes. Ralph Himes was the craze uh, solicitor at the time. Right. He's dead now. Well, I was in the unit of Kenny Collins. Kenny Collins is a Hatton Garden burglar. Right. One of them, OK? And I was in there with Kenny. And Kenny said, I couldn't tell you at the time because you'd have gone mental, all right? He said, but Ralph Iam said the deal's done. Vincent gets out halfway, your client's going away. And that's exactly what happened. That's terrible though, isn't it? It's, how can you fit someone up like that who's innocent? Yeah, can I fast forward all these years later and say, well, I was told that, and it's, it's exactly what happened. That's crazy, so isn't it? So Vincent was kept in different prisons all around the country, okay, away from me, which again is odd. The IRA boys that I was on the mard with, they escaped out the, the unit in Whitemore and had an armed escape with Andy Russell, they then come to Whitemore on remand facing charges for the escape. I was made triple category A, and for those uh, subscribers to the various podcasts and such, like yours, who say there's never been a triple category A. Yeah, I was going to say myself, I've never heard of that. Exceptional risk, triple A. Blimey. Yeah, I was the only man in this country who held that, not egotistically, but to show you that the tools of the trade that are used to effect a trial, because you're through a screen like, all the sugar turns to alcohol, Nobby. Do you remember that advert? Yeah. Well, that's what I was faced with for permanent visits, legal visits, and I couldn't come into contact with high-risk double-A category A's. Okay? Oh. So the, the, the security restrictions on that, for instance, are very, very heightened. And Vincent was being held in various prisons, as I say, up and down the country as a you know, high risky having police visits, building a case against me. And there was a number of police forces investigating murders that Vincent said I had done. And he said them in his confidential chats. Right. So the case against me was e- extremely multiplied and heightened by what Vincent told them. He told them I was responsible for a number of murders that were still unsolved. One of them, the... Uh, the Chechen authorities suspended links with England because they said I committed a murder for uh, the authorities in Chechnya. 
in this country. So that was discussed in the Houses of Parliament. Suspended links, two countries no longer talking. So you can imagine the information that he's given the police on me, they thought, wow, this one ain't solved, that one ain't solved, and it's lame. So they're trying to point, pinpoint them all at you, basically? He told them I did it. Years oh. later, people have come forward and said, Vincent's admitted to doing their murders. He's always admitted to, not all of them, but, you know, he's a bit of a water mitty, uh, 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 he's a bit of a uh, fantasist yeah. as well, as well as whether he's done any murders or not, but um, he has admitted to a lot of the murders that he said that I've done, and that's the way it goes. Yeah, that's I, what he I says. don't understand the people. Like, if, if you're going to commit a crime, then you should be able to sort of take your own rap for the crime you've committed. He you? don't know. He says I've done them. And he's got to take the rap for it. He says that's the way it goes. So, what what sentence did he get? He got a he got acquitted by the judge. Like I say, by being kept in different prisons around this week. He refused a client's uh, a, a co-defendant's conference. Yeah. So that was bad. He got acquitted and he went out and he got rearrested in 2002 for the murder of David King. Blimey. Which is, you know, he got shot of an AK-47 in a gymnasium in Hoddesdon. So how, how does that sort of, uh, obviously now looking back at the case on him, obviously originally, now it's all things are pointing at him, he's gone out and recommitted. Recommitted and it's in the same area, same modus operandi, but I, I'm not, let's just get, let's just go back a little bit. Vincent's fitted me up with David Smith and a bent copper. Fact, okay? So, in my book, Fitted Up and Fighting Back, you will, go and f you will find a number of confidential chats that Roger Vincent has had. So for all of you, those that can't see that, he's just been charged with murder and he's engaged in a number of chats with the police. So... I will give you a little bit of an inside view of what he's saying in his confidential chats, okay? And then you can decide, make your own mind up, what you think of it. This will give you a little bit of an insight in what he says. And you've seen the photograph there, where he looks extremely happy yeah. after being charged with murder. So, so that photo is his after he's charged with murder? That's his custody charge sheet photograph. Blimey. All right, so... So here we go. Right. And again, these are not documents that I've made up. You can see them, there's references, there's caseworkers' details on there. They're from the criminal justice system. They'll disclose it at the Old Bailey. But I never got these until some years later, okay? Well, 1999, actually, I was, these were disclosed to me. Now, if these had been disclosed to me at the time of my trial, I'd have gone, well, I need to... Challenge my accuser, yeah. find out what's going on. So, following the charging of Roger Allen Vincent with being concerned in the murder of Robert McGill, I spoke confidentially with Mr Vincent at his request. So, you've had the following the charging photograph, okay. He reaffirmed that he had not been present when McGill was shot and was shocked that he had been charged with the offence. He wanted to do a deal, a deal. He, and in return, he said he would supply, through a solicitor, a statement accounting for his prints being in the car, and he would supply on a confidential basis details of the two persons responsible for the murder. The persons who put them up to it included how much was paid. He stated they had, in fact, been paid to kill McGill, and they were responsible for another one whereby, it's blanked out, had been killed. From the limited details he gave, it was clear that he referred to the murder being investigated in Surrey. He said that the killers had been paid. It's blanked out. He intimated that the, I can't mention this family's name, uh, had an involvement and he stated that a thorough police investigation would net everyone involved with the exception of someone he referred to as, I can't mention that gentleman's name, he's dead now, yeah. who did not get his hands dirty. Now these people that he's mentioning in his confidential chats, would have made the, the, the ears of the police stick up, okay, to bring more body to it, yeah. okay. So he then goes on and he's talking about the murder and he's saying he'd get his solicitor down on Sunday to discuss the deal. Okay, now these are all in the book. So on the basis of that, the investigation completely swayed in my direction from a number of police forces. 
I had a hung jury in the first trial, and there was three police forces waiting to dock arrest me. Why me? Based on what Vincent has told them. It, it seems crazy, like it's just such a just a big thing on just a word of one man. It just, just where's the evidence to it? it well, Spackman was his handler. Uh, as I've said, it's come out that Spackman's made statements saying he became very close with Vincent and Smith, so much so, so that after Vincent got acquitted, Spackman was observed going in and out of his home. Blimey. On his own. Can, can I just ask you, Kev, what, um, so how did this guy have this information about you that he was telling them? Because he's bleeding. He, he, was he saying he was there or he was... He's saying, he, the murders that he's saying I did, yeah. other people have come forward and said he's told them that he did them. Or he did what one I mean is, how, how did he like, put your name in there? Was he saying he was there, he witnessed it, or...? I don't know. Oh, right. I have never received any other detailed information other than what these confidential chats have been released to me. Yeah. The, and the fact that he was having police visits up and down the country as well. And this custody record here where he's saying that uh, he's taken to the visit room at his request and confirmed he was happy to have an informal chat without his solicitor being informed or present. These are all, all engagements that he is instigated. Yeah. Um, I, I always thought that it was like, um, if he hasn't witnessed it himself, it was just sort of hearsay. I didn't think it'd carry any weight as such. Well, there's the question. Um, you don't, we don't know what he's told the police for them to take what he said as, as genuine and serious. But one thing's for sure, they came and arrested me under guns, uh, yeah, guns. yeah, uh, and they've built a case around me, not arrested me due to the evidence that they had. Right. And the evidence that was subsequently obtained during the investigation was pushed under the table. And I didn't get a lot of that information until, like I say, years after I was convicted. Because yeah. if I had, I wouldn't be sitting here now. Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, and if you're working with a corrupt police officer, or a number of police forces in the country, and you're making up stuff as far as they're concerned, and there's a wealth of people in this country that are serving sentences for murder and they haven't done it, or other uh, significant crimes, based on arseholes like Vincent yeah. and Smith making stuff up. So you know, here, here, I've got, it says, and it's in the book, visit on three's landing, PM, no problem. Police interview, no problems. That's on the landing of a prison. Where, and it, I mean, Vincent knew when he was getting out of prison, and I'll tell you why, which backs up what I'm saying to you. He writes a letter to his solicitor, and over here is a custody record, not a custody record, it's a, 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 a prison record. Yeah. So these are all genuine documents. Although it's only a snippet of it in the book, because you have to think about space and that. But he's had a police visit. He then writes a letter to Ralph Himes. Dear Ralph, I've heard that the prosecution... So who's he heard from? Well, he's just had a police visit, hasn't he? Because yeah, there's a legal sense, document, yeah. right? You're not going to hear from anyone else if you're locked up, are you? And you, you're <laughs> writing to your solicitor to tell him that the prosecution and my co d solicitor is... What's he saying? Is going to have asked for the trial to be put back when we're in court on the 13th of November. And he's, he's underlined this in capital letters. You must not let this happen, Ralph. I've been in the longest, and we're prepared to go for trial on the 15th of November. Does that not tell you that he seems to me, he's been in the longest, don't worry about the other fellow that's been charged with murder for him, that you've been yeah. setting him up for, because you seem to know what's going on, don't you? Okay. If the judge lets it get put back, the new trial won't start, won't be until after Christmas. And this must not, again, happen at all, at all costs. See if you can sort something out. So this does not happen, again, capital letters. I want to go to trial on the 13th. I don't want to come back up here for another seven or eight weeks just because the prosecution and my co-defendant solicitor would like it to be put back. Make sure this does not happen, Ralph. P.S. I don't want the case adjourned. I just changed solicitors six weeks before my, my trial. Yeah. I was made 
as I said, triple category A some time before that. So I'm meeting a solicitor through a screen and holding bits of paper up. That's why we wanted the trial put back and Vincent didn't want to, to, for that to happen. So, so much for thinking about some fellow who's charged with murder. He's having these confidential chats. He's having police visits. He's being told the deal was done. Vincent was going home. Blimey. And it's all here. And it's, he hates it. Hates it. Can you, can you just tell us a little bit, obviously, you know, now you've been committed, you've been put in prison for something you haven't done. How does that sort of sink into your mind? It's, it's bad enough if you've done a crime, but to be in there when you're innocent, it must take a real toll on yourself. I fought the system for years. Very angry young man. A lot of violence, unfortunately. But at the time, it was justified with the people that the violence was against because they were prison officers who were very violent. And it was their nature to threaten, make threats and, and issue them threats out. So I had a few problems with a few bullies, but I also had a lot of good, good to say about a lot of the staff in these prisons yeah. over the years, OK? So they say that a miscarriage of justice person will kick off and go mental because that's what they do. And I did. Yeah, well, you would, wouldn't you? If you're not guilty of something, of course you're going to fight it. You're in a unit. You're not seeing your family. You're not seeing your kids. Yeah. You just got sentenced. They've asked for 30 years to be imposed on you in court. In open court, they asked for 30 years. And they told the judge that I was responsible for a number of murders and that I was without a doubt a gunman on, on this murder and I've been out of doubt a gunman on others. And I've got all that in writing. But there was never any proof on it. Only what Vincent told them and Smith. So, I then get found guilty, I go to prison, never hear from Vincent, well why would I, yeah. okay, why would I? The confidential chats come out in 1999 and then it, I knew something wasn't right by the chain of evidence, there was gaps in it and for those who have got experience of the criminal justice system, you, they would understand what I'm saying, there's, there's gaps missing of evidence and you want that evidence. And then when I started getting it or getting leads to where it was or what it pertained to, it became very clear. Yeah. Can I just ask you a little bit about the jury? So how, how long did they like, take to, sorry, how long did they take to become to their decision? I had a hung jury the first time. Yep. Uh, that was over a number of days. Um, and then the second time, it was two and a half days. Uh, and I got a majority. But you've got to think that a majority, does that therefore mean that you had three people or four people or however many people holding out? Because Spackman stopped my solicitor in the corridor and he said, there's going to be another trial. It's before the jury had even come back on, on the first trial. Right. Uh, in my solicitor's notes, it says, way laid by, by the officer in the case, Spackman. He told us the split of the jury was eight to four. What, well, this was before they'd even, even come back? How does he know what's going on in the jury room? It's sacrosanct. Nothing goes on in the jury room. It's meant to become outside of those doors. And he told my solicitor, and I've got it all recorded in details. So did he know someone in there or have someone in there in well, connected on, with? Or? There we go, because they select your jury when you're at that grade. And then you have to select from the ones they've selected. And my second jury, I believe I had a police officer who was the foreman. Really? How about that? I mean. Yeah. So he came back and said it was eight to four, I had a hung jury, and then and the second one, again, I got a majority. Did, how, how do you deal with a sort of miscarriage of justice? Sort of, how, obviously, you've, you've written a book and you've done a lot of investigation in your own work. Is that correct, Kevin? That's correct. So, so how do you start sort of that process? Where would you start to investigate and how would you get your information? So I asked for my solicitor's case notes. That's all of the letters he sent and received. Yeah. And they gave me a wealth of information. Really? Papers you haven't even seen. Phone calls that your solicitor's made and phone calls he's received from Spackman. You know, about the chain of evidence and where we're chasing the evidence. And you've got letters from the CPS saying contact the officer in the case, Spackman, for the exhibits, for disclosure issues and such. And he was central to everything. And it's all Spackman, Spackman, Spackman. Um, and so that, that took me on another path. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have a TV for 20 years. And I used to write letters all the time. I said, my, my cell was my war office. It was my campaign. Um, and that's what I just used to write to everybody, 
write and ask questions. When I found out about the confidential chats, that starts the path, doesn't it? Yeah. And you go off then. And you keep banging on doors. And then when they don't answer, you write to somebody else. And then you write to somebody else. And you keep writing to people who have to answer questions because they're in a position of, uh, of power that yeah. they can be held accountable for. But nonetheless, the door still gets shut on you. Yeah. It's the canteen culture. Uh, and the criminal justice system is very, very, very uh, well connected to other departments. Yeah. So just jumping in there, Kevin. So even now you've done this 20 year sentence, it's not ended there for you, is it? You've recalled back again? I got recalled back to prison twice, one for common assault, whereas if I hadn't had a life sentence, I wouldn't have been recalled. The person, that I've, I actually threw a person, I threw my ex-girlfriend, she was drunk. Yeah. But it's six o'clock in the morning, she was drunk, and I'd put her indoors five times, holding her. She, she's running up and down, scratching my car and kicking it and stuff like that, drunk. Because I had to go home, because my probation officer would never let me stay at her house yeah. uh, as I see fit. It was always a problem. So I got to drive all the way home, and then she got upset, we had a fight. Uh, I threw her on the sixth occasion. I said, oh, get her off. I spent 14 and a half months for that. I've got that on camera. That's it. Now, if I hadn't been a life license, I wouldn't have got recalled. No, it would have just been as a domestic sort of argument. I'd have nicked her because she had my keys, my wallet, my phone, and everything in her freezer. So I couldn't go home anyway. So that, that could class damage as well. yeah. criminal damage. Two grand's worth of damage on my new Range Rover. Lovely autobiography, Sport, fully loaded. Loved it, loved the car. She's running up and down, scratching it, all right? And, need, I, didn't and I didn't even touch her then, I just put her in the bleeding house. But yeah. on the fifth and final time, I just said, I'll clear off. And I got 14 and a half months of that, got right. released. Um, I'm in the probation to blame for that, partly, because causing the problem of not letting me be able to stay there all the bloody time, you know. Yeah, and I had a bad probation service, I've now got a good one. I've had good others in there, but anyway, that's another story. And I got recalled again by another probation officer who said I went into Hertfordshire, my tag was 40 and they said I was not charging it and I wasn't staying in contact with them. I spent another four months in prison and then the Secretary of State said, get him out, we've made a terrible mistake. He ain't done nothing wrong. And they opened the door at 7.30 and chucked me out. As if you ain't gone in for enough with the 20 years and then, then they say they're making another mistake. I found it so hard this time. I can imagine, yeah. So hard. I mean, COVID came in, I've had my businesses, I've had to keep them going. I sold my car, obviously, two years in prison nearly. Well, 18 and a half months in total out of two years. So just sitting there depreciating in value. Yeah. Um, I lost £10,000 on it over the COVID. And now, of course, they've gone back up because, but I wish I'd have kept it and sold it now. But anyway, no, yeah, very difficult being recalled to prison. So, Kim, can I just ask you, obviously, uh, I heard that there's obviously something a hit being taken out on your life as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so for those who don't know what an Osman warning is, an Osman warning is a threat against your life. Yeah. Imminent, imminent friend. I've had a few of them. I've been in prison, I've had them. People have been paid to kill me. Are we actually inside the prison? Yeah, real dangerous people you do not want on your case. All right, that is it. Was, was that connected with the case before or something? It's connected else? with my conviction. Yeah. And me... Well, Panorama, The Guardian, and a number of other papers have covered that Roger Vincent and David Smith have had confidential chats with the police in relation right. to my conviction. So the threats have come from that, that area. So for an, an Osman warning to start, someone has to ask someone to do something. Right. And then that this spreads, it's like a ripple effect. It shouldn't spread, it should be kept in house, surely. But for the police to come and tell you or me that there's a threat against my life or your life, they know where it's come from. Because right. someone's had to go and tell them. Yeah, of course, yeah. Is that not obvious? So you can also get what's called a reverse Osman warning if the police want to issue that. Where they could go to the issuer of the threat against you and say, we know you've, you're instigating that. Right, gotcha. All right. So the police have been to see me again, said, listen, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, where's it from? I said, we can't tell you. I said, well, someone's obviously told you. So you're withholding information that could be, uh, assist me in my yeah. life to maybe live a, a more safer life. Just so 
so to speak, right? Yeah. And uh, they say, we know where the threats come from because you, you've had many of them now. And they're all from the same person. Blimey. Because they want this book shut up. They don't want it saying that they've been working with the police to fit me up and put me in prison. It's common knowledge. I mean, some people won't like the fact that I've said that. But let's have it right. We've got two pricks trying to have me whacked. Someone's trying to have me whacked. So, two years ago, before I got recalled to prison, I received a phone call. I'm, bod I'm godparents to a, a, f uh, a friend of mine who's a bodyguard for Abramovich. I'm godparents to his, one of his children. Yeah. We used to box together. We're like brothers, obviously, in the ring, punching out of each other three times a week. <laughs> All right. They went up to his brother, thinking it was him, because they didn't know him. They'd just been put onto him wherever. And they was, did it in a place called Watford. I'm not allowed in Watford, in the town centre. And these two individuals, they were making some unsavoury comments about me, saying that they were going to put one in my nut and they were going to do it for a certain person. Well, they said they were going to do it for Roger Vincent. Now, he may have something to say about that and he may want to take it up with them before maybe trying to get him in trouble, shall we say. But one of them was from Newcastle and he said, I'm a Geordie connection and I'm going to put one in Kevin Lane's nut. Another fella said he was from Essex. I received a phone call. There's two fellas up here, Kevin, mouthing off about you and saying they know you've got a son. So now they're involving my children, are they? Now, any, other, any man normally or woman would go, right, get straight in that car and go and find them and say, you're making some threats about my kids, are you? And our little baby. And you're saying this about me. But I can't do that. So what I did, because I can't go into Watford, of course, I had some friends. So we've got them in situ, Kevin. They're right in front of us. What do you want us to do? Well, of course, I only want you to take some photographs, don't I? Oh, right. So my friends are sitting there photographing these two fellas who are going around making some unsavoury comments about my welfare, my family's welfare, and saying they were going to do it for Roger Vincent. I've got those photographs. Put away. And a number of my friends and associates have also got those photographs. I mean, so if anything did happen, it's, you've sort of pinpointed where yeah, it's coming from. My friends can go and ask them quite politely. If they had anything to do with it. Wouldn't be going anywhere else with these photographs. But one thing's for sure, and if it happens to me, yeah. we'll see what happens, we'll eh? We'll know where to look. We'll know, we'll know where to come and ask some questions. Go yeah. and have a nice cup of tea, slice of cake, <laughs> and ask you some questions. <laughs> Once you've taken you out of the boot of the car. <laughs> of course, I'm only going back to the old Sweeney days. I don't know if things happen like that. But I'm sure that, you know, you can let your mind... A little bit of embellishment. Yeah. So, an Osborne warning's been issued. Isn't the first. Uh, I've been told by the people why they've been asked to kill me, and it's always because of the information that I'm getting out there in the public oh, so domain. That's the reason, it's because of what yes. you're, you're telling your side of the story, basically. Um, everything yeah. in my book is from the criminal justice system. Yeah. It's factual. You've had newspapers, BBC documentary makers talking about what I've put in, in the book. I've just been filmed for Channel 5. I've been filmed for other, uh, and I've got I'm doing some more filming soon for mainstream TV that goes yeah. all around the world. And it's all about my book yeah. and my life history. So that has to say something, and I hate this bleeding thing they do that, but the book's credentials is causing a shock. I suppose if the evidence is in the book, then it creates interest to the media and... Yeah, the film companies, etc., doesn't it? It does. It's not so much more about me and, and the films. All right, there's a number of directors that um, literally got the book. I've had di film directors buy it, and we, they, their names come up, and we've sent it to them. And yeah. um, Netflix, bleeding. Oh, I can't go into it, but quite a few. Um, it, it is raising a lot of concern, more so. When I did some filming on Friday, and they said, this goes right to the top, Kevin. I said, exactly. Spackman couldn't have fit me up on his own without other officers knowing about evidence yeah, they brought in. It must be linked to more connections, wasn't it? 
Look, if you do an investigation, you bring some evidence in, you know that evidence takes the case away from me. Why wasn't that evidence disclosed to me? And you're sitting there during the trial thinking, well, I've got the evidence, why ain't they been given that? Yeah. So they're party to my fit up. So during my fit up, you got the CCRC, it's the Criminal Cases Review Commission. The Chief Constable of Police at the time of my arrest is, was one of the 14 commissioners when I then got convicted and then sent my paperwork to the Criminal Cases Review Commission, which is a government body to investigate miscarriages of justice. He should not have been in that position with my case and it's conflict of interest. Also, staff within the CCRC knew police officers involved in my case or knew someone who knew them. And the CCRC has said, linked, it? in their view, it's still linked. In their view, this would not cause the impartial observer to form the view of biased. Well, you tell me, if, you're, if you, they're in there and they know coppers who have nicked you, or they've had party in nicking you, they shouldn't be investigating you for a miscarriage of justice. Yeah, and they it's, the same, it's the same people asking the same questions, isn't it? And that happened all the time, all the way through my, my imprisonment and such. It's always been Hertfordshire police that have been conducting the investigation. Crazy. And they should never be, it should have been an independent police force. So, we're, we're wavering off a bit here. After I was convicted, there's a fellow called Kalish, who was a prosecutor. He died of a brain tumour. A month after he got me convicted. During the trial, it's is, is evident that he was ill. Du in this hospice, Lord Chief Justice Rafferty was sitting next to his bed and they said they're going to set up a charity called the Kalisher Trust to pay for trainee barristers during their training. And where do you think the barristers were working? Only the Criminal Cases Review Commission. <laughs> I only found it out last year. Lovely. So my paperwork's going out to the Criminal Cases Review Commission, possibly being studied by trainee barristers and police officers that know police officers involved in my case. Crazy, what chance do you stand? <laughs> Nothing. No, same little circle, isn't same you? Same little circle. Out of that circle. So then I go up on an appeal based on some documents that were sent to my solicitor from a, an anonymous source from the police files. Hertfordshire Police were tasked to conduct a review of that paperwork. They shouldn't have been going into that paperwork because it's about them. Yeah. So there are two retired police officers going to the papers 20 days after they've searched those papers they contact the CPS and said there's a conflict of interest. We're friends with Spackman and Winnet. This is the other police officer. He said, I was tutored by Spackman for two years when I first started the job. So like once again, did. it's linked again, isn't linked it? Linked in. And then those police officers went into retirement after they brought, made the, criminal, the, the Crown Prosecution Service that they were, there's a conflict of interest. They went into yeah. retirement and stepped out and someone else stepped in. By which time, the documents went missing. So, we talk about the gun used in the crime. That gun was sold to a gentleman called Tam Jury in Scotland. He came forward years later and said he bought the gun uh, off of Roger Vincent and David Smith. He said, you know, there's an innocent man sitting in prison and they fitted him up. Hertfordshire police were sent up to interview him. They said they were going to nick him and report him to the Scottish criminal justice system for perverting the course of justice. Huh. He said, I'll get in the dock, I'll go to prison, and I'll take a lie detector test, he said. He said, them blokes have fit Kevin Lane up. Crazy, isn't it? He said, I bought the gun used in that murder. I bought it off of Roger Vincent. Bloody hell. So, so even with that evidence, they're still taking the word of the other, the other guy still. Well, the because he's, he's, he's a valued asset, isn't he? Yeah. Let me say this to you. He's been around a lot of people in the prison system that he was introduced to through other... Gary Nelson, he got done for shooting PC Don, uh, PC Dunn. Teeth again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so he then gone and spread his wings. People have been nicked as a result down the line. And I believe he is supplying information because he's cut off ties with a lot of people now. A lot of people will know that he knew things that they've then gone on to be arrested for that nobody else knew. Oh, really? Yeah, he's a valuable asset. So he's going through the prison system at a great pace and knots, which people who have been in the system a long time know for him in his position to be going through at the pace he is, isn't right. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, they go way over their tariffs, people normally do. Unless yeah, you've got... Did, a... did you go over your tariff when yeah. you had the 20 years? You did? Yeah. yeah. So what I did know. you... So oh, my tariff was 18 
but at the time was high. But you served 20. 20. But if this paperwork hadn't come to light, I weren't going nowhere. You don't think you'd have got out? I was cut A 16 years in. Four years later, I'm chucked out. So you, did you go through the system, like the A, B, C, yep. D? Yeah, A, B, C, D. And then 14 and a half months or 17 months, I think it was in the DCAT system before I got parole. Mm. Refused parole as well, twice. Then got it. Can I, can I just ask you, Kevin, obviously, that's a lot, a lot of your life you've spent in there for something you didn't do, but what would, what would have been your dream if you could have like, led a different path in your life or didn't get that miscarriage of justice sentence? What would you have liked to have done with your life? Porn star. <laughs> <laughs> it's never too late. <laughs> I never too late. <laughs> no, no, I, I love work. Yeah. So um, I was working at the time with a number of friends in different businesses. They've subsequently gone on to be millionaires. Right. Um, the rubbish game I was setting up in 1993, okay, that was, that's become very lucrative now. Camera security, back again. I was looking to set that up. I went to prison. And now look where camera security is. Yes, massive, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, modular homes, building homes. You know, I've, I'm way above... Well, I've always been ahead of myself in business and making money. Uh, ahead of people my age, should I say. And yeah. um, I believe I'd have been a very successful businessman. I've come home from prison now. I've, I've set up two businesses. They turn over quite a few million pound each, straight, you know, yeah. like ducking and diving. COVID came in different reasons, but I'm still surviving. Still going forward. Still going forward, you know. Uh, I thrive on making money and succeeding. I like to make things succeed. Not so much about the money, but looking at something and then looking at something and saying, I can make that work. Yeah. And I've always loved work since I was a kid. I've been working since I was 12. You know, buying all my own bleeding school uniforms, different one each day for school, different watch. And uh, I had my own flat when I was 15. Well, shared it with a pal of mine who's 18. So I'm a good money guy. I bought my first house when I was 18. Okay, and I was buying them there on after and flipping them. But I think I'd have been a successful businessman. Yeah. Can I just ask you a little bit now? Obviously, you've written your own book. How would how do you go about making your first book? How do you sort of how do you go about that sort of process? Well, I actually wrote my own book. Okay. Um, that, that's a, quite an achievement in itself, writing a book, isn't it? Yeah, but when I say I wrote the book myself, I had a gentleman called Ken Scott come in. Ken Scott's written a number of books. He's a uh, uh, he's an actor as well. He put 1,500 words in. Well, I've taken them words out before I printed it because for 1,500 words, I didn't think he deserved 30%. No. Right? But he's a lovely fella, Ken, and he's, he's, genu he's genuine like that as well, you know. He said, oh, Kevin, if you go off with your book, good luck to you, mate. He's like that. He wasn't one of those deals. Yeah. But there wasn't no, any other words in that book from other people. But I'd say, for instance, you might have read it and give me a suggestion back or said, oh, that don't sound right, Kevin. I would change it down to based mm. on what you said. Yeah. But the words initially were mine. They're all mine. So, uh, apart from the words I've taken out of the criminal justice system, yeah. documents and such, but yeah, I started writing it in prison because Joel Benet and QC said, you should get your details down on paper and make a great book. I started writing as a child, walking through the countryside to school along the canals. And then I just took me on a journey through my life as I grew up, family life, bits and pieces, and it helped give an understanding of me. Yeah. And it took me right the way through to my conviction, to the day of my conviction, to the current time in prison. But then over the years, it's changed. I mean, it now starts off in a different part so many years forward. Yeah. But believe me, as soon as you're reading it, it's like next page, next page, next yeah. page, next Straight page. Straight to the content. Straight to the content. So then I go back and I go here and I, I've written it in a manner where people say you always want to know what is next. Yeah. So I'm pleased with that. And I've never written, I, I wrote a book, I wrote nine, nine pages for Respect and Reputation, a book that Charlie Bronson did. Um, that was well received and they printed all of it, didn't change one word. So from that I went on to write the book. In 2004, had a number of offers, left it sitting there. I um, always thought there was more to go in. Came home and then got it out. Went back to prison and then thought, 
Right, I'm getting it out now. Yeah, I'm right, it's gone. I'm right, it's gone. It's gone mental. I've been filmed for, like I say, Netflix, Rupert Murdoch's channel is 2B, it's going to be put forward to them. Um, Sky, there, 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 you know, <laughs> Channel 5, this one, that one. Liquid Bullet Production. Liquid yeah, Bullet in. Production! Liquid <laughs> 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 and that's why I'm here, because they're good, they're good at their job. Just to change the temp up a little bit, Kevin, obviously, 20 years in prison, a long time. But was there any fun times in there at all? Did yeah, you great? Did you have great a, a laugh with the other guys in that? Best. Any funny stories for us? Uh, I'll bleed now. Look, <laughs> I'd have to ask permission for some of these people, but I have had some of the best times in prison that you could ever imagine. All right. So you've got the funniest of blokes, the kindest of blokes. Just because they've committed a crime, don't mean they ain't decent people. Nah, that's right. You know that and I know that, all right? Um, well, you've had Tony Argent on there, haven't you? Yeah. So it, yeah. I remember, you have the crack, so to speak. So there was a big screw called Richie. And there's loads of stories, but I use this because Liquid Bullet Productions had Tony on here. Yeah. Your viewers have seen Tony. So they would imagine and understand this more so after watching Tony on here. Yeah. This big screw called Richie was a bodybuilder. But you couldn't meet a nicer bloke. Really softly spoken, real gentleman. All right, Tony will remember him, and so will all the other cons in the system, because this would be a man that the last thing he want to do is put a hand on you. Right. Because he just isn't in it, he's just a nice bloke. So at the end of the spur, there's bars. That looks out onto where the canteen area is, where you get fed. Behind that was the laundry room. Tony's gone to me. Kevin, he, he's the laundry man. He said, What's that screw's name there? I went, Wally. He's going, Oi, Wally! <laughs> <laughs> Oi, Wally! <laughs> <laughs> he goes, That fucking screw just looked at me, blanked me, and walked off. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and off I went. <laughs> so I would always have the crack and do things like that, right? So, like, you was going to get a bit of dinner. And these are, I'm not going to go into things that have happened in prison too much, right? But I won't do that too much. But you'll go, I'll say, uh, I'll get uh, the other geezer's dinner. You might just come in here, right? Or, and you go, get his grub on the servery. What's his name? Uh, me off. His name's Me off. Me off. Yeah, just tell him it's Jack's. And you'll go, go can I have Jack Me off dinner, please? <laughs> <laughs> and the screws will look at you and go, you fucking cheeky bastard. What are you talking about? I think you've got to find you try and have a laugh, haven't you, when in them sort of situations, just to get through your sort of time, haven't you? Uh, you know, like, I believe I'd have the crack, so... It's, uh, I just... Why can't you be happy in prison? It's not, an unhappy, it's not a happy place anyway, but do you want to walk around doom and gloom? Yeah, you've got to make the, make the best of it you can, haven't you? In yes. the worst situation. Get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to get drunk. And it got me through that sentence because I'd have a laugh and a joke. Is that only homemade stuff? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. But bear in mind, I'm telling you now, you can make some proper drink if you take some time and you love it and take care of it. Right. All right? And you can get the really strong booze. I mean, really strong, 60 70%. And knock your socks off. It's a bit of you, boy. You like a drink. <laughs> well, it is the ooch, but, you know, we used to call it ropey chappies. I used to get drunk and have parties. And on my uh, prison record, it said, Lane drinks, manage him. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I did have a drink, but I had a good understanding of staff. I'm polite, I'm respectful, I like a good crack. Yeah. Uh, I'm no arm. Um, the only arm I was to was to other people, on, other prisoners a lot of the time, yeah. because they was either arseholes that nobody really liked, yeah. you know, or they were doing stuff that nobody liked, or they were paedophiles or nonces or rapists. Yeah. Are you actually in with them as well? Well, they slip onto the landings. Yeah. They get on there. And it must be hard to control yourself in that situation, though, because... Uh... You don't, you just hit them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it, really. Yeah. Well, you chase them off the wing. Uh, and I don't mean that in any other way, but there's been times when there's been people on the landings that shouldn't have been there, and you might have a cut A judicial review coming up and you've used violence then to oh, yeah. and then they say right another five years you've just demonstrated that you are not ready to be taken off the cut that you've got to have some arsehole living next door to you who may have tortured war veterans coming across Poland and he was Polish and he was torturing the war veterans for their money and then oh, killing them with his pals and the next you know he's my bleeding neighbour well he had to go didn't it? 
Yeah, so right. you need, isn't it? Yeah, so I couldn't have that. Uh, and, you know, there was another geezer once. He was in there for nine counts of robbery, two of them to pregnant women, by knife point. And he held two of them in their house. One woman was pregnant with her children. I found that he was on the landing. I said, we're at different ends of the street, mate. You're at one end and I'm at the other. We don't read from the same book. I said, now get off the fucking landing. Simple as that. You've got one choice. Get off the landing. Yeah. Right? And of course, he slips off. Other times, things happen in a different manner. But that's prison. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. So you're all in there together, and you're all in the mix. Well, you're meant to be. Not so much no more. <laughs> so, so, Kevin, for the viewers, where can they find you if they want to check up anything you've been doing or okay, look, look for your book and stuff? Where can they find that? If you want to find me, you'll find me down Madam Jojo's on a Friday night. <laughs> 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 well, Madame Jojo's was a good restaurant that Lady Diana used to go to. Yeah, really? Ain't what people may think. <laughs> <laughs> you naughty bugger, you look at you straight away. <laughs> so if you want to find me, you find Fit It Up and, and uh, fit, fit It Up and Fighting Back. You'll find that on Waterstones Online, Amazon, or Fit It Up and Fighting Back website. Waterstones are going to have it in the shop soon, hopefully. Uh, they're just seriously considering it now. So it's powerful reading is what their researchers have said. Uh, John Bolton from Netflix, and lots of other people have got it in a minute. Tom Cruise, his autobiographer, Lady Diana's autobiographer. Wow. It's on the set for all the Expendables, Megan Fox and such at the moment. And it, right across the board, I mean, I could go on and on and on. The book is doing the rounds of its own accord, not me saying it. So I want people to buy I don't make no money from this book. This money, the, the book I get from it, I donate to charity anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to bring recognition and understanding to what's happened to me and what's gone on within the criminal justice system. And then you'll get it on a number of platforms, as I've just said. Please buy it. You will be shocked at the detail in this book. And it's genuine. It's factual. I've had no court cases saying remove it or, or shut the book down. It's there for everybody to see. And a lot of you people are having it with the people that put me in prison. And you shouldn't be. Shame on all of you. Final question, Kev. Do you ever see this getting overturned and your name being cleared? Or is it, do you think that will ever happen? I do, because Panorama said that I was convicted on evidence and uh, information that was wrong. Panorama, uh, the prosecutor turned around and said that I gripped a gun inside a bag. And that bag was a Mossberg pump action and the deceased was killed with a Mossberg pump action. And they said there was one particle of, of firearm residue inside the bag. That's consistent with the gun being in there or spent ammunition. Right. All absolute, excuse my French, bollocks. One in 90 people on the train on the London Underground get contaminated with firearm residue. Fact. Test. Panorama turned around and said, that is just a bag. There's been no gun in it. There's been no ammunition in it. Because if there was, there'd be hundreds of particles. It could be a box of cornflakes. It could be nothing. It's just the bag. Yet they told the jury I'd grip the gun inside it and like I sat it to Mossberg. That got me yeah. convicted. Panorama said it should never have been used. And there's not an institute in this country that would oppose their findings. So I'm going up on, a, on appeal on that soon. But also, one point I'm going to put to you. If me and you, Lee, are charged with murder, as committing that murder together on a joint enterprise, if you're not there and found innocent, not guilty, then I'm not there. It's a joint enterprise uh, uh, nicking. Yeah. Why was Vincent acquitted? Because if he weren't there, I weren't there. We meant they've done it together. That was what they originally said. Oh, me. And I'm saying I should have had the opportunity to challenge my accuser a lot closely, closer than what has been. What had happened, yeah. What's happened. And I wouldn't be in there. And that's all going to be part of my appeal. So if that ever does get changed and um, you clear your name, let us know and uh, come and update us and uh, we'll wind it up there. Thanks for coming, Kevin. Thank you very much. much Thanks for having me. I thoroughly uh, enjoyed it. No, Lovely. I really do. I really do. Thank you. It's been great.